How to Not Romanticize Historical Figures 101. And I know some of you are confused, so let me clarify some things. This is not an art history class. This is a history of European civilizations class. But because it's the first week and I have a couple of days before I really need to get into the curriculum, I want to give you some perspective. We tend to put certain characters throughout history on a pedestal. We assume that because they are famous and because they are from what we consider to be an elevated time, that they are drastically different than us. That, however, is not true. So let's go through some of the most popular European artists in the last 600 years and ask ourselves, if I met someone like this today, would I think that they were from a different time? Who better to start with than Michelangelo? He was born in 1475 and was one of the most talented painters and sculptors of that period. In fact, he was so talented that he decided to make forgeries of Roman art just to prove his worth. At about 25 years old, he sculpted a statue in the Roman style. He then chiseled off the arms, hid them in his workshop, and took the statue to an excavation site where many other pieces of Roman art had been found. A few days later, the archaeologists of the time discovered this new statue and were very excited to find another piece of Roman art that they could present. However, when this piece of art was unveiled to the public, Michelangelo came forward with the two missing arms to the statue. He stated that no other sculptor could be as talented as him as he had fooled even the experts that were sent out to find authentic pieces of Roman sculptures. This publicity stunt brought a lot of attention to him and not all of it was good. Even though he considered sculpture to be superior to painting, not everyone personally cared about his opinions. One such person was Pope Julius II. He commissioned Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. When Michelangelo refused, the Pope said, well, unless you never wanna work again, you're gonna do as I say. But Michelangelo didn't take this lying down. Instead, he painted two cherubs, essentially flipping off the Pope's chair. Because it was so high up in the ceiling, it was impossible for anyone to see it until more recent times. Then Pope Julius II came back and demanded that Michelangelo paint the back wall of the Sistine Chapel, where in the bottom right corner, you can see a man who looks remarkably similar to Pope Julius having his balls bitten off by a snake. Next, we have Mozart, a child prodigy who many people consider to be one of the greatest composers of all time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he was normal. As a child, his father treated him like how Nickelodeon mothers treat their children. And many speculate that the only reason why Mozart continued to play and improve upon his skill is so that he could get out from underneath his father's oppressive regime. Once he separated himself from his father fully, his father sent him a letter essentially saying, you have betrayed me and I shall never forgive you. And while this was all very sad, Mozart also had a couple of other quirks that you might not have heard of before. The first time that he fell in love, he wrote the woman a song titled Lick mich im Ark, which roughly translates to Lick me in the ass. He then proposed to her sister, who he remained married to, and also was totally obsessed with. He was terrified of her meeting an untimely end, so he would follow her in the streets, hoping that she would not recognize him. He was also known to perch on the edge of her bathtubs just to make sure that she would not drown. In many of the remaining correspondences which we have between him and his wife, he mentions scatology a disproportionate amount. Up next is Vincent van Gogh, a man who was considered a failure in his lifetime, only to be recognized years and years after he passed, who painted Starry Night while stuck in a mental hospital and chopped off his own ear. While some people have described his self-mutilation as an act of love, where he sent his chopped off ear to a woman who rejected him, this could not be further from the truth. In reality, he was staying in Paris with one of his closest friends when they got into a fight. His friend left, trying to defuse the situation, and in desperation, Vincent van Gogh chopped off his own ear, put it in an envelope, and sent it to a brothel. When his friend came home, he automatically packed his things and left for good to only correspond with Vincent through letters after that point. He was also a failed nepotism baby, with his first introduction to the art world being through his rich art collector uncle. His savior complex often made him seek out women who he thought he could fix, when in reality, he went to a mental hospital at least six times throughout his lifetime. And finally, he was bad at everything. Every single one of his careers failed in his lifetime. And even though we view him as a spectacular artist in this time period, nobody would give him the time of day. He even did a bad job in killing himself, where he tried to shoot himself through his heart and missed and hit his abdomen instead. 
Another historical figure who was bad at everything was Mr. Hans Christian Andersen. Famous for his books of fairy tales, including The Ugly Duckling, The Little Mermaid, and The Ice Queen, he found some acclaim during his lifetime. But this does not mean that he was successful in any other part of his life. Almost every single one of his stories was a pity party, thrown by him for him. The Ugly Duckling was his way of explaining why no one wanted to marry or love him. Even though he was a pathological liar to those who he was romantically interested in, and also never followed through on any of the promises which he made. He wasn't even liked by his so-called friends. He once imposed upon the house of one of his favorite authors, Charles Dickens. During his time there, he collapsed onto the front lawn and sobbed because one person gave him a bad review. He also insisted that he be shaved by a barber every single day and at first asked that Charles Dickens's children would do it. Once he departed back to Copenhagen after his five-week stay, the Dickinsons put a plaque on his door which read, Here, Hans Christian Andersen stayed for five weeks. To the Dickenses, it felt like forever. And the most recent of all of the artists which we will be talking about today is Salvador Dali. He was most famous for his surrealist paintings where clocks could be seen melting off of trees. But his childhood was weird. Like, really, really weird. His parents gaslit him into thinking that he was the reincarnation of his dead brother. He tried to murder his childhood best friend. He still became a famous artist. He also was under the impression that his mustache helped him communicate with aliens. And he had a super weird parasocial, sexually based obsession with Hitler. He would constantly paint Hitler as the focal point of many of his pieces, and he was kicked out of the Surrealist Academy of Artists because he was a Nazi sympathizer. And he had some weird phobias, such as drawers, blushing, female sexuality, eggs, and crustaceans. So my question to you is, what has really changed? Yes, we have different types of technology now. There's social media, there's the metaverse, but have people fundamentally changed? And why is it that we revere people purely because they lived in a time different than us? So here are my future expectations for you throughout this course. We don't put anyone up on pedestals. They did amazing things, but they also were human. Personally, I think that history is more fun the more human people are, because that makes it seem less like myth and it solidifies itself as fact. So my challenge for you for the rest of this semester, for the rest of this class, is that you dig deep, you don't put people up on pedestals when we're learning about them, and you understand that humanity has not changed, but the world has.